Achievers, welcome back to your Easy Achievers Game Podcast for the week of June 16th. Momentous day. I'm one of your hosts, Elijah, sitting with me today is you. Just you. And we'll be discussing everything in gaming news. I was going to say it was a slow news week, but not really. I actually have a good bit of news stories for the week. Not so rapid fire is definitely living up to its name. We're going to be talking about plenty of things ranging from people can fly could be making something out based on a Microsoft IP. Uh, there was a discussion between Sean Lane and, and Corey Barlog about how games are being made right now on Twitter. It wasn't too much, but a little bit we can look at. Rumor Roundup has a couple things. Mortal Kombat 1's roster was kind of leaked. And of course, the show, I get to make fun of Embracer Group, which is one of my favorite activities of the show. And I'm sure everyone at home liked it as well, because one, it's an easy company to make fun of, and two, it feels like no one really knows what they're doing over there. And let's be honest, we wouldn't be shocked if it was some sort of front. Let's, let's, can we be real? Would you really at home be that surprised? You'd be like, nah, yeah, it makes sense. I hope everyone's well. It's a very uh, rainy week. Over here in Georgia. And it started getting hot too, which was welcomed, but also not welcomed at the same time. Because once it gets hot here, it gets so hot. Do you understand? It gets so hot to the point where you're like, oh. And, and, and I wouldn't actually mind the heat so much if you didn't have to get in the cars. Of course, you have to get in the cars to go anywhere. So once I get in my car, like the heat is turned to 10,000 degrees. And you're struggling to breathe. <laughs> so... The heat was dampened quite a bit from the ongoing rain. It's been raining, I think, the last two days, three-ish. And we're looking at more rain going into the weekend, which I'm very excited about. I have plants, of course. I talk about this all the time. I got vegetables, flowers. Me and my wife plant all the time, and it's raining. And I'm always so happy because, like, everything's getting watered. Everything's being fed, of course, with both the sun and rain. Uh, I'm always happy when that happens. Enough about me. Let's talk about the show. Not so rapid fire. This is a quick one. Mortal Kombat 1's, of course, and the creator of Mortal Kombat. No introduction here. Ed Boon says the door isn't closed on Injustice 3. There wasn't much to really talk about. He was having an interview talking about pretty much Mortal Kombat 1. One of the snippets people took out. Uh, I found it on IGN pretty much saying like, hey, you know, what's going on with Justice? And they were like, well, there's a number of factors. We were uh, already offset from COVID and pretty much Mortal Kombat was kind of hinted at it being the easier approach. And he said there was a bunch of different variables why he chose Mortal Kombat over Injustice 3. And they asked directly, is Injustice 3 done? And he said, not at all. So. We could be getting an Injustice 3 after Mortal Kombat 1. I think it's time. I actually would have preferred an Injustice 3 over a Mortal Kombat 1 to give Mortal Kombat a little bit longer of a relaxation period before we get into another Injustice... Uh, uh, sorry, before we get into another in entry in that game. I will still, of course, play and be happy. But since the way the previous one ended, it just would have been nice to have a really like slow period between another Mortal Kombat. We have an Injustice. We kind of hang around that for a little bit. And then we go back to Mortal Kombat. It will be just a you know big momentous return, and it would look very pretty on whatever new engine they picked. But I will happily wait for an Injustice Three. I actually hope that they do not continue the story from Two, as it kind of ends whatever ish on both points. There's technically two endings. I assume they would pick the quote unquote good ending in that one. So I hope they actually pivot away from a third one in terms of story and just do something else. Because I feel like they don't they don't know where they would go, but maybe they have something up their sleeves. I don't know. Another one that wasn't entirely too shocking. But a lot of people were shocked about this, and I actually am shocked about the time that it was spent in this. Uh, this is, again, I found this on IGN. Respawn worked on Titanfall 3 for 10 months before they went to Apex. I'm going to read this a little bit from the article. So the, the gentleman is named Mohammed Alvi. Al, Alvi? 
probably all of you. And it was a narrative lead designer on Titanfall 3 before it was cut. And he told Burnett and Burn Burn Network. Jesus, that much that much work on the sequel had been done. Quote, Titanfall 2 came out, did what it did. And we were like, OK, we're going to make Titanfall 3. And we worked on Titanfall 3 for about 10 months. Uh, right. In earnest. Right. We had new tech for it. We had multiple missions going. We had the first playable, which was on par to be just as good, if not better than whatever we had before. But I'll make this clear. Incrementally better. It wasn't revolutionary. And that's the key thing, right? Interesting way you put it. And we were feeling pretty decent about it, but not the same feeling as Titanfall 2, where we were making something revolutionary. You know what I mean? So what happened, according to LV, it was a combination of the multiplayer team having issues making an experience that didn't burn players out quickly, and the explosion of the Battle Royale genre in the release of PUBG in 2017. Quote, the multiplayer team has having a hell of a time trying to fix multiplayer because a lot of people love the multiplayer. People love Timefall 2 multiplayer. But the people who love Timefall 2 multiplayer is a very small number of people, and most people play Timefall 2 multiplayer and think it's really good. But it's just too much. It's cranked up to 11 and they burn out a bit fast. And they're like, that was a great multiplayer. That's something I can continually play a year, two years, right? So we're trying to fix that. We were trying to fix that with from Titanfall 1 to 2, trying to fix it from Titanfall 2 to 3. The multiplayer team was just dying. And then PUBG came out. And he pretty much goes on to say, yeah, time, PUBG comes out. And yeah, I'll read a little snippet here, too. We literally canceled Titanfall 3 ourselves because we were like, we can make this game and it's going to be Titanfall 2 plus a little bit better. Or we can make this thing, which is clearly amazing. And don't get me wrong, I'll always miss having another Titanfall. I love that game. Titanfall 2 is my most crowning achievement. But it was the right call. That is a crazy cut. Such a crazy cut that EA didn't even know about it for another six months until we had a prototype of running that we could show them. End quote. It's hard to say they didn't make the right choice. I know a lot of people say they want a Titanfall 3, but I feel like Apex Legends has done much more than what a Titanfall 3 multiplayer would have done. I would have vastly preferred a Titanfall 3. I've loved Apex. I just missed that Titanfall 3 multiplayer. It was such a good multiplayer experience, but they weren't entirely lying that you didn't burn out rather quickly. I didn't stay with Titanfall very long with both launches, both 1 and 2. Uh, two's campaign, of course, was incredible. Very, very good. But I didn't stick with the Timefall 2 multiplayer or Timefall 1 multiplayer very much. And I don't blame them for being like, well, we can't really nail it. So why would we keep trying? And they went and made Apex, which at the time PUBG was breaking all these records. Apex is probably broke every record that thing set. <clears throat> so good for them. I'm happy that they went with Apex. I actually would love to see a return to Timefall 3. I know there were rumors that they were making like a single player game that I believe was canceled or something. And and the idea of them making a single player Apex Legends game makes me want to throw up, if I'm being honest, because uh, they had one. It was called Titanfall. But yeah, let them do whatever they want, I guess. All right, this made the rounds. A lot of people were freaking out, trying to guess what this was. People Can Fly, of course, known for Bulletstorm and Outriders, are working on a game codenamed Maverick. It's based on a Microsoft IP, and it has a 30 to $50 million budget. Now, it's a very, very wordy announcement on their report on their, I believe, their website. And I can read a couple of these. Let's just read this. The production of the game will be carried out by the company in the work for hire model based on the intellectual property rights of the publisher. It will be fully financed by the publisher as the company completes the key stages of the game production contracted as part of the production process. Of course, milestones. The total budget of the publisher for the production of the game by the company amounts to in US dollars, 30 to $50 million. The, the agreement does not contain provisions specifying specific conditions that would differ from those commonly used for a given type of agreement. The conclusion of the agreement is in line with the update of the strategy of the company and the People Can Fly Capital Group announced by the company, and it goes on and on. There's a couple key things I want to point out here, because people thought this was a new game. There's a few things that point out to me that this isn't a game that they're making. And if it is a game, it isn't what people expect. So... Let's read this one more time. The production of the game will be carried out by the company in a work for hire model. Okay, so they're contracting them very clearly. 
based on the intellectual properties of a publisher and will be fully financed by the publisher as the company completes blah, 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 right? So as the company completes the key stages, so Microsoft is also making the game in some way, right? They're not just making a game by themselves. This kind of showed the lack to me as the understanding of some of these deals. Uh, because there's a couple of things. First off, 30 to $50 million is nothing for a game. So if you were expecting anything of major quali quality or quantity, you, you would be uh, sorely mistaken. 30 to 50 is not even a fourth of what God of War costs, just for an example. It's nowhere close to something like that. So let's discuss another point. The work for hire, both the money. This all points to them just working on support for something. This could be a number of things. Now, I believe Myron McCaffrey actually had the first kind of statement on this over on his Twitter account. I think he stated that this is most likely just support work for something. I believe he said Gear 6. Let me see if I can find it. And he actually made an IGN article as well. And first off, let's take a second. I really appreciate Ryan McCaffrey. If you don't follow him, go ahead and find follow him on Twitter. He's a first off a great follow. Second, such a great writer. He's still over at IGN. I'm shocked that he's done his own thing. He's kind of the one of the people out there. I'm like, really? You haven't went anywhere else and done your own thing? And, and I, I'm sure he's just happy. He's probably paid well. He probably loves his job. So he's probably not going anywhere. It's just he's so talented. You would think he would do something else just like everyone else has done. But let's see here. See if I can find it. There we go. Well, let's see. Yeah, okay, so this is actually his tweet right here. Well, there's certainly a chance that People Go 5 is a new game. The more sensible guess that it's contract support work for Gear 6 and his opinion. Now, he just links back to the original article. So there's nothing more to be given from that. But I definitely do not think it. And they actually previously worked. And, and you can actually follow the thread. Why, why did he, he say Gear 6? They previously worked on a game that wasn't very good uh, called Gears of War Judgment. So they made a key line, uh, er, eh, not main line title. They made a title in the Gears of War genre. All right, that was a game in 2013. So they have a Gears heritage. Why not bring them on to help on with Gears 6's production? I don't disagree. Or there's another thing they could they could be doing. They could, in theory, be helping maybe with a remaster of the Gears games that has constantly been rumored that has said not existed, and I kind of believe at this point that it doesn't exist. It's been rumored to death, where, and but and it's also been disproven, but some have been proven, but, but it just doesn't seem like it has much water. And if there has been a remaster in the works, it I highly doubt it's been in, in the works for like six years or five years, however long we've had these rumors. Maybe it has. I don't know. Uh, because I feel like we would get more concrete if it actually was. Anyways, I'm that's beside the point. Working on uh, the remasters, I think, is slightly more possible with the budget. Maybe they're helping with Judgment specifically, and they want a whole Gears collection, 1 through 3, and Judgment all put together as a pre-bow. That's possible, I think. I don't think that's crazy. They could specifically be working on Judgment for that. 30 to 50... Million dollars, not not crazy for just a remaster, polish this up, make this look better, do some new assets, work on the uh, actual porting process, et cetera, et cetera. Who knows? Time will tell, as I always say on the show. Should be, I should have it tattooed on my forehead. I can just point to it when I say it. Time will tell. If I had to guess, I would say it's just support for support work for gear six because i think they want that accelerated i think they want gear six accelerated to a point where it's going to come out a bit sooner than what i think many people are expecting because if the rumors are true they were a uh, coalition was working on an ip for gears and why, why is my head my, my headshot so, so awkward Hold on. so they were working on a game in the gears or sorry they're working on no ip coalition was and they had to cancel it for unknown reasons, I believe. I don't think anyone knows why. So they cancel the game. And they immediately go to Gear 6. Gear 6, I think, has been in production for, I think, two years? If the rumors were true. 
So, and if that's true, we're seeing that game 2027, probably. 26, 27, 28-ish range. Games take way, way, way much longer than they used to. So we will not see that for quite a while. So maybe they want some more hands-on to try and get it out faster. Or, like I said, they're working on Since that is going to take so long, hey, why don't we polish up the previous games, repackage them, sell them, put them on Gay Pass, make them cost $60, $70. Via Video Games Chronicle, Dead Cells is getting an animated series. It's being made by Bobby Pills Studio in France, alongside an animation digital network. It will have 10 episodes all around 7 minutes, and it will launch next year in France before being made available everywhere else shortly after. I have nothing to add to that story. Forza Motorsports Studio Turn 10 is developing a new car customization game for mobile with game studio Hutch. The, the, this is it. They had an announcement on their website. There, I read it. It was just a bunch of nonsense and flowery talk. Nothing to really report there. I'm assuming it will tie into Forza Motorsport. And you will be able to customize like your cars outside of the game. Maybe. I feel like that was a thing when Xbox Smart Glass was trying to happen in like 2013 when the game when Xbox One originally launched, right? I don't know if that's true. I think it was because and I don't know if everyone remembers Smart Glass, but they were trying to have like your phone be like a third, like a second screen. Uh, they were like advertising is like, oh, maybe you could check the map on your phone. Like, as you're playing the game, I thought it was a cool idea. Clearly, they didn't think it was cool, and no, one, probably no one used it. But I used it for a few things. I remember. I just can't remember what they were for. But I definitely did it. And you could, like, link it to the Xbox and do a bunch of cool stuff. But that that is long gone. That specific Xbox has been completely phased out. Uh, as a reminder, Xbox Snap, that was another cool thing. I can't believe they haven't brought that back. That was such a unique feature that they could easily bring back. And they refuse to do it. It's sad. I, I I hate that they don't bring it back, personally. I would love Snap in some some sort of way. Picture in picture would be much preferable, of course. Dan Hauser, co-founder of Rockstar Games, has announced his next venture after he left Rockstar on March 11th, 2020. It's called Absurd Ventures. The press release reads as follows. This was announced today. Or, sorry, this was announced yesterday, I believe, as of recording. So, on the 15th. Quote, we are building absurd ventures to create new universes and to tell great stories wherever and however we can. Absurd Ventures is building narrative worlds, creating characters, and writing stories for a diverse variety of genres without regard to medium to be produced for live action and animation, video games, and, or, and other interactive content, books, graphic novels, and scripted podcasts. And that's it. So I'm guessing he's going to just be making stories and helping and producing them with other studios to make things or maybe you hire him to make something for something i actually am unfamiliar with this specific process of the industry like what is he specifically doing is he just like hey come to me if you want my skills which is smart because he is he might be the most well-known writer in video games yeah, I think so. Of course, Hideo Kojima is up there, but Dan Hauser has to be up there as well with his Grand Theft Auto games. So, yeah, interesting idea. I like, I like it. Good luck to him, I guess. We're going to be talking about Xbox a lot this week because they had, of course, the showcase that we already covered in previous episode. Check that out if you'd like. And they also had a kind of press walkabout, I guess, press junction that they walked around and, and did little press shows. They went to Giant Bomb, I believe, is the, sh is the podcast that like got the most kind of news stories made out of it. And a lot of things were said. We're going to cover one of them right now. So this is... And th we're going to cover the actual thing, and then we're going to cover the actual exchange that happened, and which is the reason this is in the show. Xbox Game Studio Chief Matt Booty has said that both game players and the industry in general need to realize that most big games now have development cycles of around half a decade. Now, that is a tweet from VGC. 
I don't think anyone, if you'd listen to the show, is surprised by what I just said. Games do not take three years anymore. That hasn't been true really since Xbox One era. And I think even leading into the Xbox One PS4 era, games were starting to take longer. Things like Skyward Sword, although that's not a good example. I believe that had a lot of trouble in development. I can't remember if it did or not, actually. I remember Skyward Sword took about seven years. It took a lo- that's a long time back then. Like That was crazy to say. Like, it, when the, uh, Skyward Sword came out, when was that? Skyward Sword release date. Twenty eleven. So twelve years ago. That was insane to say that a game would actually take that long to development. And I want let's make sure that I'm correct. I believe that was actually seven years of development time. Around five years. I was a little bit off. And it began apparently right after Twilight Princess in two thousand six. So that makes sense. So I was a bit I was a bit off. So they took about five years, and that it was weird. That was like, whoa, that's almost double the time. And I feel like that's when it kind of started, right? That 2011-esque era, or, or leading into 2011, of course, around 2006. That's, that's when it's starting to begin. And let me know if I'm missing a base here, because I remember reading a lot about that growing up. So let me know if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's going to be around the time that things are going to start to take longer. And that's why Naughty Dog is so impressive because leading up into the PS, uh, in the end of the PS3 life cycle, into the PS4, they were able to release Uncharted 1, 2, 3, and Last of Us within like, oh my god, when did, hold on, let's see, Uncharted 1 release date, let's see. So Uncharted 1 releases in 2007. Now, let's see when Uncharted 3, because they they were able to release Uncharted 1 in 2007. Let's get the Uncharted 3 release date. 2011. So they did 1, 2, and 3 in four years. That is incredible. Incredible. You can argue, oh, you know, they're doing palette swapping and these things. You know, they're just using the same assets. Oh, I don't think you understand how exactly impressive that is, even if that was half the case. And Last of Us comes out a year later, I believe. In 2012? No, 2013. Yeah, they come out in 2013. Last of Us release date, let's see. Yeah, so it comes out two years later. So in the time span of six years, they make some of the best games ever made. Look how impressive that is. Of course, that is not the case now. They cannot do that. I don't think they want to do that. Honestly, and I would love to know how they got that done, because that was impressive back then. Imagine doing that now. I mean, that's probably. Impossible without. Hundreds, maybe maybe thousands of people working on a game, and even then. That is that that becomes so unwieldy, you can argue that it might even take longer. So we're in that span of time where we're finding ourselves wanting games that just take too long to make, and we're buying them once and never again. We all go back to the Sean Lane tweet. We're going to be talking about him in a second. Games are taking much longer, and they're costing way more. Famous Sean Lane quote. Right before he left. Interesting. Left in quotes. He was probably pushed out. Maybe, he left. maybe not. I don't know. We don't know. I shouldn't say that. We don't know what happened with Sean Lane. But the famous quote, everything's costing more, taking too long. We have to figure out what to do. Will we let this balloon out to where games are going to take six, seven years? They cost $400 million, $300 million to make. We have to market them, right? I feel like people forget that. Every time I see development costs, I go, okay. It costs $300 million. How much did you pay to market the game? Because if it's like movies, you pay double. Right? You pay double. There, Rockstar, in the, uh, was it Rockstar? Or was it in the Microsoft acquisition? I, there's so, I read so much garbage. I get 
confused. I, someone right now, there's a game being made by someone. I believe we only know this through the Microsoft acquisition, like talking points and things. Someone's making a billion dollar game right now. There's a game right now that's being made that costs one billion dollars. I think it's Grand Theft Auto. I think that's obvious. Grand Theft Auto Six. Also, 2K announced that uh, their earnings for like the next few years, and they projected to make eight billion dollars or something like that. I forget how much money it was, but they project to make billions of dollars. I wonder when Grand Theft Auto is coming out. Anyways, that's probably related. I'd say, uh, of course it is. But back to my point. Games are getting to the point where there's ballooning to the point where if you start a game right now, a triple A game, you want it out. Let's say Xbox right now is like, hey, we need our God of War. They're not they're not doing this, obviously. Hey, we need our God of War. Um, yeah. So if we start right now, we will get it around 2030. Like, God, that is and that's getting to a point where you're not going to be able to retain talent for that many games. Right. So let's let's say you get let's say we get lucky. We get a Kojima at 35. Right. How many games does that does, does someone like that have? That's three games, maybe. Before they're retiring in, in you know 65 ish era i don't know if if y'all saw the news i didn't i don't have it here but todd howard said the next elder scrolls is probably his last one just think about the math of that right think about math wise how that works out he goes this next elder scrolls that's coming up takes seven eight years six if he's lucky it's almost a decade <laughs> like he's this is doing six six seven so I don't know how much how old is Todd Howard? Um, how old is Todd Howard? He's fifty two. The man will be sixty something. He looks great for fifty two, by the way. He'll be sixty something after Elder Scrolls Six is done, pretty much, and, and is released. And let's say he makes another game after, right? Because they're not going to immediately go, "Oh, let's make Elder Scrolls Seven. That, that's not how they make him, right? Most likely to go to a fallout. We're looking at 65, 68, something like that. I mean, let's, let's, it's going to be hard to keep these very, very talented people because games are also taking longer. You're, so you're going to be losing like the visionaries behind these projects. We already have a problem with linking studios with names and retaining what it even means for them. I heard a very compelling argument um, from Colin Moriarty over on Last Stand. I was listening to, uh, this was weeks ago. I don't know. I was listening to something. He brings up Bioware. Why? Why? What? Why are you excited for a Bioware game now? What makes you excited, right? At, at home, if you if there's something right now that you're like, oh, you know, I I'm excited for Dragon Age, but why are you excited? Because Bioware's making it, or is it because it's a Dragon Age game? Because if it's Bioware making it, that can't be true. Bioware hasn't been Bioware since Mass Effect 3, probably, right? They lost everyone to the fall of Anthem, to how they treated everything with, with how that went down, to Mass Effect Andromeda. In that whole time span, they have lost everybody that has made Bioware Bioware. So why do we still call it Bioware? That's just how it works. It's strange. It's kind of weird, right? I, I, when he brought it up, I was like, oh, I've never thought about it that way. I wish I remembered that episode. I would say which one it was. I apologize, um, but it was it was a great episode. And I was thinking to myself, like, yeah, why do we call them this? Why why are they Bioware now? They don't have anyone. Casey Hudson's gone. They lost the writer. He came back for a consultant role, which is like cool, I guess, but. And they're just it, th who's left. That mi that means we need someone left. It's th that that kind of happened with uh, Neil Druckmann. He's not even a f he isn't a founder. He just rose up in that studio, right? So the, the no one I don't think anyone at Naughty Dog is a founder anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah. Off the top of my head, I don't think anyone's left. So it worked for them. You can argue it got better under them. Under when the founders left, which is interesting to say, but I've gone on and I'm rambling at this point, but I find it interesting that games are taking this long. 
talent is going to the wind. They're having to pay people more to retain them. Something will break. Or something will change, I think, in a major way. I do not think the current model of video games is what they want. I think, interestingly enough, Insomniac might be the method to follow. Make a game. Make a side game utilizing a lot of the tech that you learned from the original game. Make it maybe half the experience. Make make a lot of money. Maybe you make a lot of... You can kind of combine the two. And that's the problem with Game Pass, right? That's not really how it works. You have like this giant pot of money from Game Pass that you have to divvy out to all these people. It just doesn't make any sense how this thing is going to be profitable to this many studios, to this many projects. When you encounter like everyone's like how, how much everyone costs to getting games on game pass. It's I always when I, whenever I think about the money of game pass, it just never makes sense to me. I want someone to explain it to me. Like how, how does everyone working at game, the Xbox game studios, right? They're at uh, over 23 studios. I think something crazy like that, maybe even more. And that's before we bring in Microsoft uh, Activision Blizzard merger, which might be dead in a few weeks. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I have so many thoughts in my head right now. Uh, I find myself looking at at everything happening in the games industry currently with how games are being made, how everything's more expensive to just be almost like a balloon. That might pop something I feel like will change soon. I don't know. Maybe the economy will force some sort of change, right? Games are still cheaper than ever. If you don't understand it, uh, just make, you can do it right now. Go to an inflation calculator, type in $70 and then type and then that and pretend like you're in 2007 and make it 60 bucks, right? That money just doesn't stay the same that way, right? So the infl inflation has ballooned to the point where we're probably paying $60 now anyways in terms of inflation. So they're not even getting the full benefit of the dollar. So they would need, now need to increase it to $80 to actually make it to the point where it was an equal footing to the $60 they were getting prior. And I have this theory that the ones who, who need that extra money from the sale just make the special editions and the higher end people make it to where it justifies the lower price. That's just a crazy thing to me. I have no idea if that makes any sense to someone like that actually knows the economics of video games. That's just a little thing I've had in the top of my mind. Like, well, maybe that's what, why there's all these additions. And I don't know if this is really dumb to say on either. It's obvious that it is, or it's dumb that this isn't how it works at all. But that was always my theory that like, Oh, this is why we have four additions because we're able to get the margins on the collector's editions. That is double our margins on the regular. I don't know. And let's not forget digital is so much more money than physical, of course. You wonder why every collector's edition has a digital game now? That's why. <laughs> I hate it. I'm buying two... Achievers, I've been incredibly terrible this last week, two weeks. Immediately bought the Starfield uh, Constellation Edition because I, I I just I couldn't I couldn't pass it. It looks way way too good too good. Uh, this morning the watch was really cool, and uh, this morning I spent my time buying the Spider Man Two Collector's Edition, which I gotta say, the PlayStation Direct website is terrible. I'm gonna say that again, terrible. It is garbage horrible horrible billion dollar company billions of dollars and your site can't handle spider-man 2 releasing you knew what time it go live you knew how it would work it took me 40 minutes to buy it because the site would just keep not working it, it, either it wouldn't load it would tell me time out it would say request time out i would go to buy it the, it wouldn't let me type in my card because the field was blanked and it, you know, like it wouldn't let you interact with it. 
horrible experience. Horrible experience. If you're going to do these releases on your direct store so you can get more of the money, we all know why you're doing it, is so you get more of the money. You don't have to cut it with anybody. I don't blame you. Make it fucking work. Make it work if you're going to do this. It is so annoying that you do this. I tried buying the Hogwarts Legacy controller from my wife for her birthday, I think. Not her birthday, I'm sorry, for, for our anniversary. Did work. Because your website was so bad. And it sold out in like 10 minutes. Horrible experience. Hate, fucking hate that website now. Oh, wasted 40 minutes to buy a single item? It's ridiculous. Sorry, went on another rant. Ugh. Now, back to the original story that I was trying to read for you. So, I read the original tweet. I'll reread it because it's been so long. I'm already 35 minutes in the show. We're not even past not so rapid. Xbox Game Studio Chief Matt Booty has said that both game players and the industry in general need to realize that most big games now have a development cycle over on half a decade. Corey Barlog retweets this, says, Yeah, he is so right. It's been like this for a while it's exhausting working on one thing for that long. Worse for the games that are eight plus years in development. A 10 year project would likely kill me. Sadly, it's only going to get longer as the hardware generations advance. Sean Layden, our. Oh, that makes me upset. <laughs> Sean Layden, sorry, it, one of his things. Sean Layden tweets at him It's only inevitable if one allows it. Of course, very cryptic. Sean Lane very r rarely says anything on his Twitter. And he's come back to say, hey, it's only an if you allow it. Don't make them that long. Don't push yourself that long, I guess is what he's saying. I would love an actual full conversation or what he means by this. Of course, just one tweet with one sentence means anything. So can't really parse in what actual Sean Layden is thinking. He's enjoying his giant check from Tencent. So enjoy that, Sean Layden. <laughs> enjoy your Tencent money. By the way, love your pride flags in your uh, in your name bio. Maybe read about how uh, prideful China is to their people. Anyways. I want to say... That, hmm, let me think here. How do I want to pull this? Yeah. Sadly, it's only going to get longer as hardware generation advance. Let's start there. I actually find it, I don't know, I find it hard to believe that's going to get longer, but Corey would know. I'm not saying he's wrong, by the way. It's just, it's hard to believe that. That was sitting here at, at a time point where someone could start a project right now and it could take literally a decade without problems, right? With it just going normally. Or with, I guess I would say, the normal amount of problems. Not without problems at all. Just the regu a regular dev cycle would take. Like a normal dev cycle right now could take 10 plus years. Or not 10 plus years. A ten it could take up to 10 years. Which is pretty insane. But is quite likely to happen if we keep kind of pushing... These hardware generations find it interesting. They said hardware generations because no, he says hardware, so he doesn't say console hardware. Never mind. I was about to say console hardware isn't the highest end of gaming, so I don't know why, but that makes sense. He's talking about PCs, I assume. But interesting that he's a first party studio, so why would he say hardware generations? Because when you say generation, you know, you could be talking about graphics cards on PCs because that's that's the highest end of gaming, right? You're that That's where you get the highest end, the 4K 120 frames. You're going crazy on an Xbox Series SX PS5. We're seeing more and more with the Starfield talk, of course, from last week and being pushed into this week as well. That games are taking. Game games are getting so sophisticated that you're not able to push the envelope in terms of frames and fidelity. You have to pick one. You can't pick both. It's either it's going to look prettier or it's going to have more frames. You choose which one you want. In going into this generation, I thought there would be a middle ground. 
I actually love what um was it Miles Morales that had that? I believe it was where it was like you could do 4, 4K at 45 frames or something or or they were able to make something work that I was like, oh, that would have been great at launch. They didn't have it at launch. It was like a few weeks later, but they were able to have it work. Oh, my God. Achievers, excuse me. That was rude. Sorry about that. I didn't, hopefully that was far away enough away. I didn't destroy anyone's ears. But. um, Back to back to my point. I, I I thought this generation would be kind of a happy median between the two, right? You don't get the highest frames, but you don't get the worst fidelity. It's like somewhere in between that we're able to to really knock it out of the park here. We've I think we've hit the generation where we're gonna have to either pick between the two, and if it's up to the developer choice, I think a lot of times they're gonna want a locked frames versus a stuttery one. I bring it up again this new Star Wars game that came out. Jedi Survivor had incredibly I've never really experienced this on a console before and I don't play on PC and so I've never really experienced like jittery frame rate but Jedi Survivor's frame rate was so jittery I had to put it down when I was in the main area because it was so bad it was so bad to the point where I had to make sure it was locked at a lower frame rate in the like fidelity mode so I wouldn't get sick because the frames would go so crazy at certain parts in the open world of the main area. I think it was Jetta. I think it's what it was called. So that's a prime example of you didn't have it locked. So it was unlocked and it was stuttering. It was just an open frame rate. So it couldn't stay at a, uh, at a high, higher milestone. I wish it would. It didn't. That sucks really bad for that game uh and i not only did it near the end I, it's funny enough all the other planets were fine i think it was just because so much was happening in the original planet it would just tank the frame rate so gross again it would make me almost sick to my stomach the way it did it but i think we have i i'll in fear of repeating myself let's leave this discussion and move on as I find myself going in a loop here. I I thought we were going one way and we weren't another. A Digital Foundry video that uh, recently came out today, actually, I listened to a little bit of it, says that we might see more of Starfield's decision-making coming soon, right? More people might be like, hey, well, no, we like it much better when it is locked because it won't stutter everywhere on your screen. Right. We're able to get 45 in some areas and we're able to get maybe 60 in some areas. But we can't have it dynamically locked. So we're going to lock it at 30. So it feels better. Like it feels like OK everywhere instead of great in some places and horrible in others. I can't say they're wrong. Because I just experienced the opposite of that. And I preferred the locked. We shall see. Let me know what you think, of course, in the comments below. Tweet at me at em 9000 Whatever you think. Sorry. Tweet at me at EVM9000. There we go. I, I, when I say M's, I tend to, like, let them mumble into other words. I apologize. That is not so rapid fire. Uh, 43 minutes into the show, so let's go into what have you been playing of course this is what you have been playing at home let me know if, of course in the comments below tweet at me at evm9000 again so let me know what has been on the docket for the week what have you been playing what have you been enjoying i have been playing more diablo good news though i have finished legend of zelda tears of the kingdom it was a fantastic experience i could not have loved my time with tears of the kingdom more if i'm being honest there were so many different things i would love to bring up to you about why i liked it what i liked about it what it did differently what i liked it more than breath of wild why i finally feel like i'm a part of the zelda hype because i haven't been a part of the zelda hype in a while skyward sword came out that was never my game uh, it completely turned me off when I learned like the Stanima fruit mechanic. I was like, that doesn't make any sense to me from a game from a pure game design aspect. I think Stanima fruit in that game is very bad. I, I, I should play it one day to see if my thoughts are 
confirmed, I guess. Uh, but we're not talking about Skyward Sword. Uh, leading into Breath of the Wild, similar things. I played Breath of the Wild all the way through. Played a good bit, actually. Did a lot of that game. And I found myself saying yet again, why do people like this so much? I'm not saying it is a bad game. I'm not saying it's a good game. I'm not saying it's a great game. That game is amazing. I don't actually blame anyone for saying it's a 10 out of 10 necessarily. Although for me, I don't quite think it would hit there. Maybe it would. I don't know. I would have to really sit down with the game again. I don't blame anyone for that. I'm not saying it isn't a great game. I just did not see this revolutionary design aspect of the game. I, I think... Oh, God, this is going to make a lot of people mad. I think the Dark Souls Souls like genre has done way more for the industry in terms of both game design and aesthetic and. I want to make sure my thoughts are clear because this is a very <laughs> uh, inflammatory uh, resp uh, statement. Dark, the Dark Souls genre of games from from software have done more for game design a, a commitment to game aesthetic and art direction than i think breath of wild has done to the entire industry by quite a bit and now I, and maybe that is comparing apples to oranges i just see everyone's argument that like oh my god this will change the way gaming will work for a very long time and i would love to be pointed to the games that are inspired by breath of the wild that really made a splash i can point to a couple you know i can point to souls likes and the kind of revitalization of souls ish games or i really i would just say hard games but it, it, that's hard to convey in a elegant way but I think the that specific genre of Souls game have done way more for in terms of game design, the gaming industry, and revitalizing a, an, an entire genre in an, in a genre of itself than Breath of Wild has. So I find it interesting that so many people say that Breath of Wild changed a lot of things, changed this thing, changed that thing. I just don't find myself agreeing. But I find myself saying that about Tears of the Kingdom. I really do feel like this is what many will th will see and it will be inspired. I think many people making games right now will see this way of game design and how they approached game design and really apply it into their games. Let's really think about it. Let me. OK, nothing important. Let's really think about Tears of the Kingdom. I won't spoil anything here, but I want to I want everyone at home to really contemplate what I'm about to say here. If you've seen anything about Tears of the Kingdom, you understand that you can manipulate the game quite a bit of different ways. That's the allure of the game, I would argue. And probably the main point why I would recommend this to anybody is how inventive you can be and how you can break the game in quotes. I would now I will say that again, break the game in quotes. This game can be broken but it is also in, impossible to break a lot of mechanics in this game right it is both easy to break and impossible to break what does that mean right the tools that this game gives you allows you to completely manipulate a lot of the shrines a lot of different i would say points in the game checkpoints you you could say uh where in one game it would say, hey, do this. You have A, B, and C. We want you to use A to manipulate B so you can use B to cross C. Correct? That was a little confusing, so I'll say it one more time. In a normal game, in terms of game design, you can kind of boil down a lot of games to an A, B, C. A. We want you to utilize A to manipulate B so you can use B to cross over C, right? I think that's a a much more boiled down version of a lot of games, but I think you can kind of boil that to many of the game's design, right? 
you can utilize certain things to make an action happen, but that almost always only has one way that action be, can be done, right? C, you can ha you have A and B, but C can only be done one way, right? A and B can be manipulated freely, but C can only be confirmed one way. And you need to do C in order to finish the level or mechanic or mission, etc. And in Tears of the Kingdom, it does something so special. It introduces D. And D, who doesn't love D? Let's be real here. And what D does is tells you, hey, you, we have given you A, B, and C in this shrine, in this level, in this encounter. We're telling you the same that mm, we've done in games for 30 years. A, B, free to use, but you only have the one C that I can get through. But let's never forget that D is still there. D is what I call in Breath of the Wild, or sorry, in Tears of the Kingdom, is the is is the everyday is, is the I will use this. D is the wild card. There we go. D is what can you think of to make this shrine work? What is your interesting idea? That we've given you the tools, right? We You still have A, B, and C, but you also have D, which is anything that you've had up to this point. Maybe you have a cart that you fuse to a shield, and you can use that to skateboard around this railway that originally we had an idea that you would use a ball to get across, and you would have to almost ride the ball in a way. Or you would have to make some sort of cart system to ferry you across this entire walkway. But maybe previously, you had a skateboard made for fun to to kind of uh, get around in, in the environment. And that's, that's the D in this game, and I love that. And again, I love the D. U utilizing whatever you thought of prior to do whatever you want in terms of the game design in Tears of the Kingdom. And I love that. I love that there's always this wild card to every, uh, every, almost, almost everything you encounter to the Korok people, to the uh, uh, shrine designs. Uh, one of my favorite ones, like I mentioned before, was like they wanted you to get by in this railway system. I had my skateboard that I've been using the whole game. I had a cart and I mashed it up to a, uh, I think it was a minecart at that point. I don't remember which one it was. But I mashed it up and used it, and I got around the the shrine that way. That that was so cool. That was such a cool feeling. Or figuring out other interesting ways. Or, or and my favorite part of Tears of the Kingdom was, I wonder if this will work, and it's always yes, right? You might not have nailed the execution, but whatever you thought of most likely works. I'm I'm reminded of a a very wise man, Gene Park, over at Washington Post, saying near the end of the the or sorry, uh, when the review period was done, he said, um, all these shrines have such intricate ways of completing them, but I almost made everything, I almost did everything in the game by just making a really long bridge, which is very funny and very interesting to think of that at the end of the day, a lot of solutions can just be done by just making a bridge, but a lot of people are having much more fun doing the it's the inverse of that or like hey what's the most interesting way i can i can create this well maybe i'll grab a rocket and i'll attach it to this board and if i angle it just right uh i'll put another rocket here and this will shoot me up i can jump off glide over here that gets me to you know and and you can go on and on tears of the kingdom is a love letter to the event to the inventive mind almost to the how creative do you think you can be but i understand some people might be scared off by that i would ask you to i would ask you to make sure that you're seeing that you're not 
being ward off by this, I guess. Make sure that, yeah, you know, a lot of the things I just said, that sounds really complicated. And I don't, I don't really want to play a puzzle game. I want you to sit down and really think about it. There is still A, B, and C that I mentioned. You can still do these shrines in the intended way that are pretty straightforward. They're probably easier, too, in a lot of ways. I've done a lot of shrines in a, in a fun way, but it probably would have just been easier to do it the actual way that they want you to. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do a fun way or a, a creative way to solve a problem. And I was able to. And that was always so nice to find out. Uh, hey, can I do this? Yes. And I always love that. So although I know many people out there are already enjoying this game, but if you, if if what stops you is it seems like you have to have some sort of degree in engineering or or some sort of love of puzzles or anything like this. I would argue that that isn't here. Let's not forget that this game is technically still meant to be enjoyed by children. Not technically. You could argue it's geared towards children still, right? I think this is actually the most mature Zelda game I've played in a very long time. At least since Majora's Ma Ma sorry, Majora's Mask, I'd say. Because it gets into pretty mature themes. But don't be discouraged. The design is still there to really communicate to you that, hey, you still have this solution here. You don't th they never really put you here and you're just like, hey, uh, figure it out. Really? There is really subtle ways that they tell you, like, you know, this is here and this is here. Maybe combine these two or maybe use one independently of the other. And that will still manipulate them to accomplish your goals. I have bored you enough, I believe, on my level of Tears of the Kingdom. This is something that I think is going to be very special. The ending to this game was very special to me. Not, nothing I will even dare bring up here. Uh, the narrative of the game was very special. It was something I did not think I'd say in a Zelda ever. <laughs> the narrative was very good. But let's move on to the actual show. And let's begin Rumor Roundup. I can't recommend Zelda enough. Uh, this is one of the situations, of course, it's made by Nintendo. So there is no wait till it gets cheaper, right? You either buy it or you don't. So I recommend you do buy it. If you find I actually use this as an excuse to buy the Nintendo voucher, which is a hundred bucks for two Nintendo games. Um that that was great to me. You pretty much get uh if you play your cards right. So the Tears of the Kingdom is a seventy dollar game. I hope I hope I'm not wrong about that. I'm actually gonna double check because I'd hate to be wrong about that. Tears of the Kingdom price. Six nine eight. So it is seventy bucks. So it's seventy dollars. So if you think about it this way, you're getting a second Nintendo game for thirty dollars, which is impossible, pretty much. So I used the voucher. I got Tears of the Kingdom and I got Skyward Sword. Eventually, one day I'll play it. I'm sure. Uh, I was between that and Kirby. I was so close to buying Kirby, but I, I don't think I'm the Kirby guy. I don't think that's gonna happen. Maybe one day, but not right now. But enough of my ramblings. Room around it. Sony demands a 90 on Metacritic. Former Sony, sorry, let me start over. Former Santa Monica art director on God of War, Raphael Grissetti, stated in the Flow Games podcast that Sony demands at least a 90 score on Metacritic from its big name studios. I saw this making the rounds a little bit. I just wanted to quickly comment in on how not surprising this is. It's a shame as uh, I don't know if many people know this at home, but a lot of bonuses actually are tied to how well Metacritic uh, score is, uh, which is a shame because scores are so dumb. But I guess it's a way of judging it. I know a lot of bonuses are actually granted with sales milestones as well. But as far as I understand, there are a few studios that do do some sort of Metacritic tied bonus if you like go over this you get this much or whatever unsurprising I, I mean all this really says is we demand like a great games so i didn't really see too too much about this i just wanted to bring it up as 
A lot of people were talking about this. Uh, speaking of things that Sony execs say online, I want to say, ooh, I didn't put this down, but it reminded me about a story. Um, so pretty much a Starfield, around the Starfield FPS discussion, an actual pretty well-known guy in like the commentating of... I don't know what he does, to be honest. I, I I remember he had a pretty big Twitter following, but like this guy that pretty much said, like, why is Starfield being shipped incomplete without like a 60 frame smoke pretty much? And a dev at a Sony studio pretty much said, like, that isn't really a marker on if a game's done or not. It just depends on the vision. And just because it doesn't hit 60 frames doesn't mean it's not finished, which I, th- I think is another thing people again aren't super surprised about every game you make doesn't not every game someone makes is like oh well when can we get it to 60 frames right it just depends on what the game is what is their vision like they said you know if it's a walking sim don't really need to hit 60 but you know there's a bunch of different things i i don't quite remember that specific exchange but it's not honestly very important to cover really so i just wanted to bring that up though because i found it interesting that so many people uh, around the 30 frames to 60 frames Starfield argument. It's so shocking how many people just don't get how games are just made, period. Just in general. Um, they don't understand why this game is 60, why another game's not 60. There are times where that is brought up and it's warranted. I actually think Redfall was very much warranted when they said it wasn't going to be 60 frames. Uh, that game isn't pretty, so why because you're not sacrificing anything uh i just think it i think that is a case of a game being technically unfinished and just bad uh not very well designed and uh, many other things are wrong with that game not the least of which is the frames but it's just interesting so many people coming out saying like you know oh oh, spider-man runs 60 and these things and it's shocking that they think that is in any way a comparison. Like, who who amongst us would say there is really anything similar about a Spider-Man and Starfield in any way to where you could compare the two? I mean, they're both video games. That's about it. That's pretty much as close as, as the comparisons from a technical and visual standpoint from what I'm looking at start and end that they're both the same medium. And I understand because I think other mediums, it's so much easier to compare. Like you can pay, you can compare books kind of, you can compare movies. Um, sort of as long as you're comparing the right movies and the right books, but video games, you can't compare some, but many, many are uncomparable as they're just different. And if you don't understand how different Starfit is, maybe I should make a video trying to just tell you why it is. Star Ocean Second Story, a PlayStation 1 game, may be getting a remake as the logo for the game appeared on Square Enix's support website. The game is called Star Ocean Second Story R, which follows their naming scheme for remasters as they have remastered their first game and it called it Star Ocean First Departure R. Don't see why this would be on their support website if it wasn't real. So get excited. I wonder when this will be announced. If it's soon or not. I mean, they have a logo made up and they already had it on this website. So you'd imagine semi soon, but we'll see. Mortal Kombat 1 roster was leaked. Now, this is a slight spoiler. Again, I do do timestamps. So if you would like, you can go in the description below for timestamps on where to skip around. If you do not want to be spoiled on the roster, I know some people don't want to be. I know most don't care, but I just wanted to bring it up just in case that you didn't want to be spoiled. So now this is not a full roster. What happened is a... A well-known leaker called, and I found this on Reddit uh, slash Gaming Leaks and Rumors. It's a great Reddit, by the way. I love this place. Uh, so there was a previous uh, Mortal Kombat 11 leaker called R0000R. So Roar? I don't know. But he confirmed 
a list from a bunch, apparently a fake leakers list. You can actually see like where they talked about the insider. Insider in quotes, like the, the guy who said they is, but he confirmed what was in the leak and what was right and what was wrong. And I will start from one down. I will include even the wrong ones, just so you know. So number one, Ashra. Number two, Cyrax is not included. So number one was Ashra. That is included. Number two, Cyrax not included. Number three, a female Nightwolf. That is not correct. Not included. Number four, Havoc. That is included. Number five, Jade. That is not included. Number six, Johnny Cage, of course, is included. We already know that. Number seven, Kenshi, of course, is in it. We already know that. Katana, we already know she's in it. Kung Lao, we already know, is in it. Lee Mei, I don't believe we know. that She will be in the game, Lee Mei. Liu Kang, of course, is in the game. Melina, of course, we saw her in the trailer. She's in the game. The next two were new characters. Both were wrong. I don't know if they were given names by the car- by the person. Naitara is included in the game. Raiden, of course, we already know that is in the game. Reiko is, of course, in the game. Uh, sorry, we we didn't know it was, was in the game. Re, re, R-E-I-K-O is in the game. Reptile is in the game. Scorpion, of course, is in the game. Sector is not in the game. Shang Tsung, of course, is in the game. Sindel is in the game. Smoke is in the game. That's very cool. Sub-Zero is in the game. And Tanya is in the game. So this is all confirmed by R000 or whatever R. Leaker, he has confirmed past Mortal Kombat 11 things. If he is to believe, the list I just gave you will be included in the game. I am not a huge Mortal Kombat guy. I do like Smoke. I do like playing my guy Sub-Zero. He's very cool. Um, aside from that, I don't really have... I love Kenshi as just as a character. Uh, Kung Lao was a cool guy too. I have some fun ones, but I'm glad Sub-Zero's in it. Very glad to see Smoke is in it, too. He was very cool. So those will be probably my two my two playables. We'll be curious to see if this is real, by the way. I'm not saying this is real. I don't know. But the person has leaked things in the past, apparently. Korea's video game board has leaked the existence of a game called LEGO 2K Goal. So this follows the previous LEGO 2K Drive. Apparently it was... Kind of consensus. I saw some people saying it was good. Some people saying it was bad. Looks like Lego's trying a different aspect of sports games. Similar to maybe how Nintendo did with their sports games. Maybe they're trying the similar thing. But they are going to try a soccer game. And football, of course, if you're in Europe and like to say things incorrectly. Um, there you go. That's Rumor Roundup. Let's start the show for the week. Embracer Group has commenced a restructuring that will see many changes that will span between now and March 2024. Here are the actions that will take place, but they are not limited to any of these actions. Of course, Embracer Group has found themselves in quite the pickle. We're going to talk about a lot of them today. But let's talk about what restructuring they're going to commence and how we can make fun of them. Jokingly, of course. Matthew Karch appointed... Interim Chief Operating Officer and Phil Rogers appointed Interim Chief Strategy Officer to co-lead the program planning and implementation of the restructuring. Reduction of general overhead, corporate publishing and selling general and administrative expenses costs. The closing of studios and termination of projects that have not yet been announced and with low projected returns. Creation of a more comprehensive centralized process for game investment and progress review while maintaining creative freedom. Consolidation of companies and businesses, including review of operating group structures, reduction of investments into in external development with greater focus on internal development based on owned or controlled intellectual property, increased fund external funding. Sorry, increased external funding of internally developed large budget games. So, of course, externally funding of internally. So increased external funding within like, you know, you might need contracting or something like that. Renewed focus on the group's main business areas, implementing a centralized. Excuse me. Implementing a centralized and standardized, more data driven and precise approach to game forecasting. An open letter from Embracer Group CEO Lars Wingforce also released and uh, also released an open letter. Sorry, an open letter was released by Lars Wingsford. And it's lengthy. 
So I'm only going to be grabbing some snippets from the actual letter. I'm not going to be reading the whole thing. A lot of it's just garbage, mumbo-jumbo things. If you'd like to read the whole thing, of course, you can find it yourself on their website. Or uh, I think I got this original. I got a lot of the main body of this from, like, I got the open letter and things from Gamatsu. But you can find it in plenty of other places. I found this pretty much everywhere to, of course, make sure everything was correct. Quote, this morning, we announced a restructuring program across the Embracer Group that will make us leaner, stronger, and more focused, self-sufficient company. I want to share some background and context to this decision and what it means for us going forward. During the past years, Embracer invested significantly both in acquisitions and into a strategy of accelerated organic growth. Huh, organic. That's an interesting way of putting it. We have acquired some of the world's leading elite... The, sorry. We have acquired some of the world's leading entertainment IMP we have invested into one of the largest pipelines of games across the industry. The program presented today will transform from our current heavy investment mode to a highly cash flow generative business this year. It will enable us to meet the worsening economy and market reality as a strong company and will fundamentally change our prioritization of growth with raised capital towards optimization and growth based on our cash flows. This is a break in the thing. Of course, there's more here, but I'm skipping ahead. Embracer currently engages close to 17,000 people. And while that number will be lower by the end of the year, it is too early to give an exact forecast on this. There will be another break here. I'm, I'm cutting down uh, further into the letter. Our new executive management team members, Matthew Karch and Phil Rogers, will work to implement a revised thorough review process for investments in our ongoing and potential new game development projects. They will also take lead on further consolidation of operations, including review of the operative group structure. We will have an increased focus on accountability across the group, ensuring performance is in line with, our, with or exceeding current targets. End quote. There's more CEO talk at the end of this, of course, as I said. If you'd like, uh, this is shocking to say the least. Uh, oh, wait, let me back up. This is not shocking at all. I'm sorry. The quite opposite of what I said. It's shocking that <laughs> they made this giant letter and are talking as if they didn't see this coming. I guess they were just, I don't know. I can't believe they put themselves in this situation constantly eating more and more and more studios and they're shocked that oh we missed the cash flow so that completely destroys us that is not a form of good business if you miss a single cash flow of and of course it was a big number i'm not saying like it was no small number but if if you have ballooned to the point where you need a giant investment cash flow and you are relying on another company to make sure you aren't floating away that's your problem i cannot believe they put themselves in a position that they're this week they missed they missed one cash flow injectment and they're now they're bumbling madnessly and not knowing what to do currently completely revising their entire future I do not see light at the end of this tunnel. 17,000 people. That is insanity. The well over, I think there are 50 plus studios or something. The Embracer Group is probably close. It is just an example of what not to do. Just what not to do. Embracer Group, how many studios are, do they have? I always forget it's just so fucking many. Uh, they're around probably 138 across 40 countries. Are you fucking kidding me? Who do you think you are? <laughs> like, who, who do you think you are to do this? To think you're this important? To buy Lord of the Rings? To, to, to just spit? on the games industry this way not know what's going on walking in with all i wherever you're getting your money i'm assuming some sort of investment funds or uh money uh someone someone must believe in you i don't know who does 
but this giant mafia is of being created of, of just random studios being put together and having like umbrellas inside of umbrellas. Like if you ever see their company structure, it is a mess. It's like they have so many studios. So like they have studios going up to other studios to like, then there's people above them. Then there's like, it, and it just goes up and it looks like a mess. It looks like a mess. It looks like someone tried to make like a corporation out of studios pretty much, which I understand that's pretty much what publishers are, but not to this extent, not to the point where you're having like five different umbrellas and then you have like three umbrellas above them looking at that. Like it's their structuring is madness. I can't believe they're still even trying to pretend like they're going to be here in like 20 years. Maybe they will not be in sheer force of will and money, but I really don't understand who they think they are. Like, why? what gives you the gull to walk in the games industry and just be like, yeah, we're going to take THQ Nordic's pretty much a naming scheme. Uh, we're going to run. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be the Embracer group. We're going to just buy everything. We're going to have all this money. We're going to get all this IP, and we're just going to sit here and ruin it. I have zero faith in this company. Embracer Group is a mess. Sorry, I had to go do something. So that's that's why there's like a random cut here. Embracer Group is quite a mess. They are pretty much the epitome of like, hey, don't do that. Everyone should just be looking at them. Google, Apple, you know, anyone who has any interest in, in entering major publishing just look at them. They're just, it's a mess. I very much don't like them. They just give off a gross corporate vibe. They don't seem to know what they're doing. I don't really trust them. They just give me a weird feeling that they're just going to, because they have the Lord of the Rings IP now, they're just going to run this thing into the ground. I think they're really going to just pile it into the ground in, a, in just the worst way. We're already seeing it with Gollum and Minds of Moria. None of them look great at all. They're, it's Lord of the Rings. You're just going to ruin this thing. It's gross. I wish you had, like, self-respect, if I'm being honest. Because, like, you would peel back. You would peel a lot more back and be a lot less wasteful. It seems like they just do not know what they're doing. They're just bumbling around, just buying random things, owning all this random stuff. It's weird. Very, very weird. I'm not done making fun of this, as if we look over at a recent investor call, the newly promoted interim executive Matthew Karch said some incredible words when talking about the newly acquired IP, The Lord of the Rings. Quote, we own Lord of the Rings, and we know we need to be exploiting Lord of the Rings in a very significant fashion and turning that into one of the biggest franchises in the world. And that's obviously something we're going to be doing. That's a much better use of resources than some of the other projects that some of our other teams are working on. Working together, we have those opportunities, and we're super excited to see that work relatively quickly, end quote. All this, of course, follows the news of the mis of a mystery company pulling out of a deal last month that would have seen a $2 billion cash flow into the company. I believe it was $2 billion. I might be off on that. Let me know if I'm incorrect on that, Chiefs. I mean... Wow. I mean, they're just saying it. Now, I understand they might have had a translator for that. Um, specific. Piece of because I believe it was translated from German or Dutch or something. I, I don't remember. But wow, um, that's incredible to that they're just saying, just saying it, just saying it. Hey, yeah, we need to exploit it more, which you're not incorrect. You need to use the Lord of the Rings IP, but to exploit it and like double down and have like six or seven Lord of the Rings games. No, 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 no. Make one really good Lord of the Rings games. Use maybe three or four of your best studios to like help each other work on it or something. Have some uh, support worker. I don't know, but th I do not believe in them whatsoever. I don't believe in them one iota. I think they are going to be gone not too long they're probably going to just hold these ip unless they go bankrupt or something and have to do a, a similar thing to thq and do like this fire th sale thing where they just sell everything off and uh, everyone just runs out and buys random ip that go flying out of nowhere but they, they I, 
it is shock. It's shocking to say the least. I wish I hope for the best for people working there. Like if you're at a dev studio, I have no no ill will for you, but the corporation running everything looks pretty gross from here. Like to the point where I am not I'm not a businessman, but you seem unsustainable ten times over. Like you don't even seem like you know how to get by with just half of your studios, let alone how could you do tri- double that. How do you make have what's the quality assurance? How do you know what you're doing? We all saw what happened in Saints Row. I was there. I can't believe it. How bad that was. That was pretty shocking. That was pretty shockingly bad. I don't trust you. And I think you're just going to keep messing up. We'll see. Quick news on the Xbox Showcase Extended that was released. This was, of course, a couple little things. There was a lot there. I'm only going to be talking about the new things that were announced. I will not be like, you know, I will not. It's not the regular showcase like breakdown I do where I go piece by piece. I'm only talking about the new news that was announced at it. OK, let's start off with High on Life is getting a DLC called High on Knife. It looks very fun. Lamp Ladders League was shown off. It's going to release October 3rd. The First Descended, a free-to-play looter shooter, is getting a cross-play beta from August 22nd to the 28th. Hi-Fi Rush update announced adding two new game modes, one called BMP Rush. More enemies die the faster the game gets. So pretty much like you start off, you know, slow. More people you get, the faster you are, the faster you're doing things. Power up, tower up, all skills are lost. And as you defeat Waves of Amy, you become stronger and regain the skills. So, like, you start off with nothing. Each wave, you're getting more and more power-ups and bonuses and all these things. More skills, I believe. Phasmophobia is coming to consoles as early access this August. It's coming to PS5, PSVR 2, and Xbox Series S and X. There was also 10 Xbox... Sorry, there are 10 idea Xbox titles coming to Game Pass. That was, it, uh, I believe, shown at the very end of this. Very impressive list here. I'm starting off with Another Crab's Treasure. Little Kitty Big City, Tectonica, Sea of Stars, Harold Halibut, Galacticare, Neon White, Minico's Night Market, The Bookwalker, The Wandering Village. Very, very interested in another Crab's Treasure, Sea of Stars, and Neon White. I want to try those three out when they come to Game Pass for sure. Not like super, super duper interested on in the other ones. I only saw a little bit of Bookwalker. I'd have to see more of that to really understand. Why is my, why is my phone? blowing off it's nothing i'll have to see the other ones more closely to really determine if i want any of them but those three are specific must plays the ubisoft forward this will be going game by game of course they open with the Prince of persia gameplay due out january 18th looks really really good Seems to be getting negative feedback. I saw something on YouTube that like it's getting very much disliked. Of course, you can't see dislikes anymore. You have to like get a plug in and maybe it's not always accurate, I think, or something. I've, I've heard it's not always accurate, but it said they were getting more dislikes than likes. I don't know what people out there are smoking. This game looks great. I cannot wait to play this one. January 18th. Not soon. We got six months, but I'll be there. I will be there to support this game for sure. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora gets a date of December 7th, and they showed off a lot of gameplay and story details. You control a Navi that was captured by the RDA and was trained to fight against your people, which leads you to your escape, and you are trying to be accepted back to your people. Pretty basic storyline, I think, here, right? You are captured by the enemy, you're trained to fight your people, you break out, you go back, everyone's like wary of you and stuff. The game looks very nice. They did very well with presenting this game, I feel like. It is clearly Far Cry Avatar. It's clear as day. Made by Massive, by the way. It is a Ubisoft game through and through. You're going to be taking out your bases. You're going to be fighting this thing. You got your... They showed the bow with, with like explosives on it, which is like, yep, that's been in like the last three Far Cry, so I'm down. I will be... I'll be here. I, I very much enjoyed it. Fun fact, Alex former co-host very much fell in love with this game i haven't seen him this excited for a game in a very very long time he was very very hyped about it so if you uh jived with alex back in the day you might enjoy this game as well i can't wait to play it 
a good revitalization to the Far Cry formula it seem, would be very nice. I am very excited. Not a huge Avatar guy. It's just the game looks good. Love the flora. Love the design. All these things. All those things are impressive. Just the actual literal, the literal movie. I just don't love. Everything else is pretty though. Captain Laserhawk, a Blood Dragon remix, a new anime coming to Netflix later this year. It's by Addy Shankard, if you know him. He is the Castlevania Netflix anime guy. So, very much promising. I'm excited to watch it. I have nothing else to add. X Defiant, it's coming this summer. It's getting an open beta from June 21st to June 23rd. Coming to current gen consoles and PC. I am very curious if this will do anything for anyone. I heard the game is surprisingly good. They seem to actually have got their TTK down. If you don't know what that is, that is time to kill. That's kind of the main driver of many online shooters, right? And if you can nail down a really good TTK, that's going to get a lot of people to come in. Like a very satisfying, like it doesn't take quite too long to kill. It doesn't take quite, but it, but it doesn't feel like you're dying too fast. You know, stuff like that. It seems like they've nailed it. I will see. I'm still hesitant on the game. It looks very generic, but we'll see. Ubisoft also detailed its launch plans for the game. It includes 14 maps, 5 factions, 5 modes, 24 weapons. In year 1, Ubisoft will add 4 more factions, 12 new maps. Wait, did I just... Sorry, that's year 1. So, in year 1, I thought I literally wrote the same thing. In year 1, Ubisoft will add 4 more factions, 12 new weapons, and 12 new maps. But they're and but of course over the lifespan of the game they'll get everything else previously listed. Hype. The factions apparently are based on Ubisoft games. Seems promising. Again, have to see more. Uh, the Skull and Bones was showed off in the most the weirdest way. They had a band come out. I like the song. Don't get me wrong, but they didn't show anything about the game. Skull and Bones will have an open beta August twenty fifth to August twenty eighth. I just want this release so we can stop talking about it. To be honest with you. Uh, Division Resurgence is coming this fall. It's a mobile division game. Not touching it. Don't really care too much about it. Uh, Crew Motor Fest coming September 14th. Uh, Crew Motor Fest. Looks like Forza Horizon. Looks like they're trying to nail that. If I want to play Forza Horizon, I will play Forza Horizon. Assassin's Creed had three showings. One is their VR game coming to Oculus Quest. I did not get the name. It's, it's called Assassin's Creed Nexus. Uh, Assassin's Creed Jade is coming to mobile. It will be having a play tasting later this month. Assassin's Creed Mirage is the final title we'll be talking about in the Assassin's Creed lineup. It showed off extended play, gameplay and showed the date of October 12th. I mean, it looks like Assassin's Creed 1. It looks like Assassin's Creed 1, 2, 3, 4. It looks exactly like how they used to play. So, if you want that, cool. It's 50 bucks, so it's not like a full time, like, you know, full price game. That's nice. Looks like they're going to try and nail a, an Assassin's game. I w I'm curious if they're just going to see, like, do people want this? I don't really think they know what they're doing, if I'm being honest. I, I don't know if they know what they what vision they want Assassin's Creed to be. So I'm actually much more interested in Assassin's Creed. Um, What is it called? Oh, my God. The, the, the witch one that they announced. It's not important. The the pre the the one that's like set in like uh Salem. I'm much more interested in that and see where the direction of the rest of Star Wars or Star Wars. Jesus, I, I see, Star Wars is next. So I read that. Uh, the the rest of the Assassin's Creed thing is now we are going to be taking a sip break. Of course, if you have an open beverage, I want you to take a sip with me. Okay, I need a little hydrator to finish off the show with. Okay. It ended with Star Wars Outlaws, their open world Star Wars game being developed by Massive. It is led by the protagonist K Vest. Looks like very much a Outlaws game. Looks like you're a smuggler esque character. You're going to be doing odd missions, fighting off the Empire a little bit uh, while you do it. I can't wait. We don't know too much about the game other than like it's a open world Ubisoft game set in this area. Looks like you can fly your ship around and shoot things. That looks fun. Looks like you're going to be uh hyper jumping to other things it looks like they put in a lot of money to get this game looking very good i am excited the little uh, uh speeder look cool too i can't wait for this game i am excited but it's you know a ubisoft game i hope i hope the story is good 
that's the Ubisoft showcase. I thought it was fine. It was a good showcase. Uh, a lot of middle stuff was weird. They started strong, ended strong. Everything in the middle were pretty weak, though. Didn't really care about much, much, most of it, pretty much. Microsoft Gaming Chief doesn't need... Or, sorry. This is the, the headline I copied to um, get a link to the article. So, originally, this was a Bloomberg piece. Picked up by, of course, everyone else. There wasn't much here, really. It was just a offhand comment, pretty much. Phil Spencer does not see a need for a new Xbox. As speaking to Bloomberg, he said the following. He doesn't feel an imperative to release another Xbox. That's not the feedback. Quote, that's not the feedback we're getting right now. Right now, we're pretty set on the hardware who we have. End quote. Now, if you believe the rumors from one Moore's Law is dead on YouTube. There's already an Xbox in development. So... I think he's just being deceptive right now. I highly doubt he will let... Because we know m probably with more confidence that a PS5 Pro is happening more than an Xbox Series Y or whatever is happening. So is he going to let PlayStation release a new PlayStation and them not release anything? That would be troubling to say the least. Troubling to say the least. So I do not believe him. He has lied before. I do not think if... If and I wish someone would push back immediately on it, be like, so if PlayStation released one, you would not feel impelled, compelled. Like that would be weird. So I do not believe him. In an interview at GameCenter.biz, Vice President and Global Head of Subscriptions Nick Maguri was asked about their first party titles coming to P P uh, PlayStation Plus Day One, and said the following: "Quote: We're happy with our strategy." Putting games in a bit later in the life cycle has meant that we can reach more customers 12, 18, 24 months after they have been released. We're seeing customers still get excited about those games and jumping in. For us, that's working. Occasionally, there'll be an opportunity to invest in day and date releases like Stray, and we will jump on those when they come in. But for us, letting those first party games go out to the platform outside the service first, that's working, and that will continue to be our strategy moving forward, end quote. Not shocking, I don't think, to anything. To anything. I, they don't need to. Why would they? They don't need people to sign up for PS Plus. They want. They're. They know you'll do both. So. So why do? Why? Why? Why put it on there? They. I would actually argue they probably should do a separate service. Just like Xbox did with Gold and Game Pass. <laughs> so. They don't need to do that. I think most people who are listening to this show are like, yeah. Why would? We're all buying the next God of War, the next Horizon, the next Ghost of Tsushima, whatever it is. So why would they have to just fight you giving it free? Free in quotes, of course, with the subscription service. Over on the PlayStation blog, this is date updates. PlayStation Plus games for June is up. And there's some news on PS5 game streaming, by the way, for premium members. Here are the games joining the PlayStation Plus catalog next week, so very soon as of, uh, as you're listening to this. Far Cry 6, PS4, PS5, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, PS4, PS5, Rogue Legacy 2, PS4, PS5, Inscription for PS4, PS5, Solstice, PS4, PS5, Tacoma, PS4, Deus Ex Mankind Divided, PS4, Killing for 2, PS4, a game trial for WWE 2K23 for PS4 will also be available on June 20th. Let's see here. Uh, they also mentioned from June 20th to the 30th, they'll have another activities for PlayStation Plus members. You can read about that if you'd like. Uh, more PlayStation Stars things. We're moving on by all this. Uh, let's see. I wanted to see if I can find, because they talked about PS5 streaming. Did I miss it? First off, we are very excited for that. We're currently testing cloud streaming for supported PS5 games. This includes PS5 titles from PlayStation Plus game catalog and game trials, as well as supported digital PS5 games that players own. When this feature launches, Game Cloud will be uh, for supported PS5 titles will be available for use directly on your PS5 console. That means as a premium member, it will be easier to jump into your favorite games without downloading them first on your PS5 console. Our goal is to add this as an addition benefit to playstation plus premium as part of our ongoing efforts to enhance the value of playstation plus uh premium is much needed in value i don't see a need to ever get it i actually only have essential because i originally had extra and then i was like i'm not using this 
So I just stopped. I'm like, why, why, why would I pay for something I don't use? So I stopped it. Premium needs value. I never see anything. I'm like, oh, I need to do that. I don't see anything for extra either. So, uh, I, but also PlayStation is not my main place to play. If I was probably mainly playing on PlayStation, I probably would do it. But right now I'm like, no, I'm, I don't do it. It's just money going away for no reason. But very good news for PS5 streaming, though, for cloud. Very happy to see that come to PS5. It's been on Xbox. It's a very nice feature. Very happy PlayStation Kitty. Metal 4 Refantasia is coming to PlayStation and Steam as well as Xbox. They did annoying marketing things, and they, people didn't know. It is coming. Hunter Call of the Wild will be an Epic Game Store free title from June 22nd to June 29th. Geoforce Now adds Age of Empire 4 in Dordonged. Xbox Game Tiles will be coming to the service very soon if you're excited about that. Keep in, uh, keep up with that specific game. Or, sorry, that specific service to your horse now. Apollo Justice Ace Attorney Trilogy is coming to PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC out early 2024. This includes Apollo Justice Ace Attorney, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, Dual Destinies, and Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Spirit of Justice. Exo Primal second beta test set for June 15th to the 18th. Pragmata Capcom's yet to release attempt uh, at a Kojima S game was delayed at the Capcom showcase. The Capcom showcase was so bad, I did not even cover it because there were no news there. The Pragmata was delayed there. Cool. I don't even know what the game is, so I'm not e I'm not sad nor mad nor happy. I don't care. Skull and Bones, like I said previously, will have a closed beta set August 25th to the 28th. That is date updates, and that's the news for the week. Let's talk about what's queued up for the weekend. Of course, this could be a video game, a podcast, a TV show, a movie. A comic book, a book, an audio book, really any sort of medium that you want to. What do you have queued up for the weekend? I don't have too, too much. I hope you do. Let me know what you have queued up, of course, over on Twitter or comments of this video. I answer every single comment that I can. And for me, I... It's kind of going to be a slow week for me. I don't really have too much planned. I've kind of like... I finished Zelda, so I'm kind of on that Zelda high. I might just relax. Maybe play a little Diablo, a little Marvel Snap, and just relax. I don't think I have vast plans to really jump into anything right now. Might be some movie watching happening with the wife, or maybe just relaxing with her over the weekend. I don't know, but not too much. I don't think I'll have much to tell you next week in terms of new things to play. Just going to be focusing on the things I have. Uh, we will be getting Final Fantasy very soon, so I'll just be waiting on that. When that releases, I'll buy it, of course. Aside from that, that's going to be the news for a week. This was a long episode. This, I, I, I want to say I had to cut up the recording, so I don't know the full time, but we're looking at what? Hour and a half out of 40? You already know, So of course, since you're listening to this. But I want to thank everyone for joining me this week. This was a great, a really, really great episode. I had fun. I did all my ranting and ravings. I'm actually going to have to do a lot of editing to this one because uh, there were a couple pauses I want to clean up and I have to splice two episodes together because I had to do something in the middle one. But thank you so much for coming. This was fun. I had a great time talking with you today. Let me know, of course, in the comments or Twitter if you have any rebuttal or problem with anything I said today. Let's start a discussion over on Twitter at EVM9000, of course. Uh, I prefer public, but you can DM if you'd like, but publicly is much easier. Uh, DMs are just takes time, whereas public, I could quickly tweet back. DMs, I try to be a much more careful approach. Aside from that, thank you so much. Remember, like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend. You know what to do. Five-star review on a podcast service of your choice. And until next time, go Chief.